Welcome to Mariner's Church Online. I'm so glad that you joined us today. If this is your first time with us, welcome. Let me tell you what you're going to expect over the next several moments. We're going to pray together, we're going to sing songs together, and we're going to study God's Word together, the Scripture. In the last several weeks, we've been in this teaching series called Prayers for This Moment, where we're looking at psalms in the Scripture, psalms that really give us comfort and direction in this crazy and chaotic time that we find ourselves in. And so we really hope that you'll be encouraged and inspired today to follow after Jesus. Inez is gonna open us up in prayer. Psalm 63, seven says, because you are my helper, I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. It is my heart as we begin this service that God would give us a heart of worship, even in this time of struggle. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your presence that you are indeed our helper. In this time of unknown, in this time of challenge, in the time that already so many of us have lost some things, Father, some have lost their jobs, some, Father, are fighting for their health. I pray, O oh God, that you would remind us in all the ways in which you are present in our life, all the ways you have already helped us, and all the ways you have made promises to us that you will keep. Lord, would you give us a heart of worship? Would we wake up in the morning and would you put a song in our hearts that we wake up singing, oh God? When we experience bad news, would you put in our minds and in our mouths first and foremost a praise and a worship to you? Would you lift up our hearts to trust you in this difficult time? You, we have nowhere else to go, oh God. You are our only provider. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.
nothing can stand in the way of our praises to the one who is most worthy. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. Yeah, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. such good news that I need to hear. It's so good to be reminded that the God of breakthrough is on our side, that when things seem so filled with despair, that He is always there for us, that He never leaves us and He never forsakes us. Let me read this passage over us to remind us of this truth. Romans chapter 8, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Can any of these things separate us from the love of Christ? The answer is no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, whatever that may be, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing in all of creation that will separate you from the love the Creator has for you. There is nothing in all of creation that will separate you from the commitment that Christ has to you, that you are his son and you are his daughter. You are forever his. He is on your side. He's on your side. And I'm going to pray that over us. And I specifically today want to pray for the healthcare workers that are in our church. So many of you, and we are grateful for you at all times. But with what's going on in the world with the coronavirus, we've been reminded, we've been reminded in new ways just how much you give, how much you sacrifice, how much you care for us, how much you serve people as the hands and feet of Jesus in our world that you provide care for us. And this is a overwhelming time and a stressful time. And we wanna pray for you today but I also want to encourage you to reach out to us. There's, there's two things that we're going to do today for the healthcare workers in our church, in, in our community that we care so much about. If you will get in contact with us, we're going to have information on the screen for you now. We're going to pray for you every day. We're actually going to reach out to you and connect with you and see if there's anything that we can do for you because we care about you. You to us are heroes. You are in the middle of a crisis and you run towards people in need and towards people in pain. And we are so thankful for you. By, by looking at you, we are reminded of our great God, who he runs to us in our pain and he ran to us in our sickness. And so healthcare workers, thank you. You give us a glimpse of the love of our God. 
And so we want to connect with you. But also, we want to serve you in a tangible way. In listening to the healthcare workers in our church, we understand that because there's not school happening now, many of you are struggling with how you can serve in your profession, how you can serve people, and yet you are wrestling with childcare needs. And so our church is going to offer free childcare for healthcare workers in our community. And so there's information on the screen. And if you'll reach out to us, we will get in contact with you on how we can serve you and provide childcare for you as you serve people. And so for the next several weeks, we want to provide that for you if it will be of help to you. Emergency child care for our emergency workers. Those of you who are running to the crisis, we're thankful for you, we care for you, and we're going to pray for you now. And so church family, gathered all throughout homes in Orange County and even other places, can we pray for our healthcare workers now that they will be reminded of Romans 8 as all of us are reminded of the great love of our God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this passage that we read. The reminder that there's nothing in all of creation that will separate us from the love that you have given us in Christ Jesus. I pray that you would remind everyone who's watching in this moment of that beautiful truth. But specifically today, we want to pray for the healthcare workers. We are so thankful that our church is filled with them and they add so much to us. Their, their care and their compassion reminds us of you, Lord. And right now, they are in the middle of a crisis. And so we pray your blessing on them. We pray your strength for them, your energy for them. We pray your wisdom for them. We pray that you will sustain them that you will use them to serve people as you always do. And will you uphold them, Lord, with the strength of your hand? Will you meet all of their needs according to your riches and glory? Will you provide for them everything that they need? Lord God, I pray that they would sense in an overwhelming way, even as we're praying now, your peace and your joy. Lord, please care for them as they are caring for so many of us. And Lord, help our church to serve them well during this season. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.
So we sing all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry and these bones will sing, sing great. Sing it out. We sing. That is so good. Well, welcome to Mariner's Church Online. And we're so glad that you're here while we're all staying at home, making huge changes to our life, believing and hoping that it's gonna make a difference. But we all have questions. This week, I got to spend time on conference calls with pastors all around the nation, and they had huge questions. And they're going, what do we do at times like this? Um, they ask me, they go, I guess, because I'm old, they go, you live through the financial Turnarounds in the 70s, the 80s, uh, 90s, 2008, the Great Recession, and now this. Times of national crisis, earthquakes, wildfires. What can we, what, what do you know? I mean, what answers do you have? And while well, I didn't have many answers, and this is a unique time where we have a global pandemic and then a financial crisis, and at the same time we have to stay at home, our kids are at home, we're working from home, and there is so much stress. And, but there are two things that I thought that are powerful that we do know at this moment. One is that we know that while everything changes in our world, we have a God who never changes, a God who loves us and cares for us. And he is the same yesterday, today, and he will be the same tomorrow. And also at the same time, at these moments of huge concern and insecurity, there are moments like this that also give us the opportunity to help us have clarity on what's most important in our life. What are the things that we can hold on to and trust? And what are the things that are simply not trustworthy and we can't base our life on? One pastor in Indiana asked me, he said, my people need certainty. I need to give them certainty. What can I give them that is certain? And I said to them, I don't know that you can give your people certainty, but you can give them clarity. And that's really what God's word gives us. It gives us clarity in times of confusion. Think of it this way. Imagine you're watching a football game and it's the 
Fourth quarter, there's only three, four seconds left in the game. It's the very last play. And the team's down like on the four-yard line. And so they call timeout. One team goes to the side. The quarterback talks to the coach. He has a play. He comes on. The defensive captain calls the play. And so on the field, everyone knows what the play is on offense, and they have absolute clarity. There is no certainty as whether the play will work, but they have absolute clarity. And in this time, while we can't have certainty, we can have clarity on certain things. Today, we can have clarity on how we need to think because God's word, God's word gives us truth to live by. I want to have, I, today I want you to think about what it means to be clear on faith and on love. Faith is an important thing. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, faith is the confidence of what we hope for will actually happen. Hope is just a wish. We hope that the virus will go away. We hope that markets will return. We hope, we hope we have a lot of hopes, but they're just sort of wishes. But faith is when hope so moves to the confidence that something will be so. Then he goes on and it says it gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. Faith, the opposite of faith is not fear. The opposite of faith is sight. When you can see something, you don't have to have any faith. And so he says it gives us the assurance of things that we cannot see. So how does hope so come to the place where we have the confidence that something will be so? It's simple. It happens all the time in life. You can hope that you're going to have uh, that somebody will make you brownies tonight. You can hope that you'll have brownies, hope that you'll have brownies, hope that you'll have brownies. But it's not until the baker in your family says, I'll make brownies tonight, that you have the confidence that it will be so. And that's the way it is with faith. Faith is the confidence that God is who he says he is and he will do the things that he said he will do. Faith is when you take a hold of one of God's promises and you believe that it will be so. And that's what faith is. And our need at this point in our life is to trust in the promises of God. It resolves and we can have clarity at that moment. Then the second thing is love. The opposite of fear is love. It says in 1 John, such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. When we are overwhelmed with fear and we don't know what to do, we need to fill our hearts with God's love. And so today what I want to do is I want us to look at what faith looks like when we don't know, when we're uncertain, we can't see the future, we need to hold on to faith. And then what does it mean to embrace love and have God's love in our life? So we're going to look at two Psalms, Psalm 62 and Psalm 63. And these Psalms were written by David at the same, at the same time in his life. In fact, he was in the same situation in his life. Uh, he was in the wilderness in the desert. What happened is David, um, he had problems in his family and he never really resolved them. In fact, he let him go and they were so painful that his son Absalom absolutely hated his father. He wanted to destroy his father. He wanted to take his father out as king. And so what he did is that he would meet people just outside the city gates. And as they came because they needed justice, he would meet these people and say, my, my father's too busy. He doesn't care about what you care about. If I was king, I would care about your needs. I would give you justice but he's just too busy to give you justice. And he did this every day for four years. And he won over this time the people's hearts. And so people began to believe that Absalom would make a better king. And so he got an army together and he led a coup. And ultimately his father, David, had to run and flee from the city of Jerusalem out into the wilderness. He lost his position. He lost his wealth. He lost his family. He was away from his friends. And he was in the desert alone. And in those kind of moments, when we are alone and we're uncertain and there's extreme pain, we have the opportunity to get clarity in our life. What really matters? What can we rest on? What is most important? And so David reflects in his life and he writes down what he thinks because he has a moment of clarity. And so he reads or he writes down in Psalm 62 and he contrasts two times in his life, two seasons of his life, when he lived as a God alone person, where he lived by faith. And then the other side is when he lived as a God and person, where he lived by sight, what he could hold on to 
and what he could grab, what he could see. And so he reflects on this. And so I'm going to read Psalm 62 to you. And you can see in this part how he focuses on God alone. He says, my soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. I find rest in God alone. In God alone, my hope comes from him. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. My salvation and my honor depends on God alone. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. David reflects on a time in his life before he was king, when he was a shepherd, uh, before he defeated Goliath and all the success in his life. And he says, in those days, I was a God alone person. My soul found rest in God alone. I trusted in God alone. Uh, I was unshakable. I was clear uh, that God was in control and that I could trust him, that he was loving and that he was good. And he said, I remember in that time in my life, God promised that I would be king. And for 20 years, I waited for God to fulfill that promise. And even though there were good times and there were extreme bad times during that season, I trusted in God. And even when I had the opportunity to take out King Saul that Eric talked about two weeks ago, he said, I didn't take it because I was willing to trust in God's timing and that God was good and he would take care of me and provide for me. And in those days, I had the freedom of trusting in God. I lived with peace and security. There was no worry or anxiety. But he said over time, and I'm not sure even how I did it, but I began to trust in the things that I could see. I began to trust in God and my wisdom, trust in God and in my desires, trust in God and my timing. I wanted things when I wanted them. And the results were in my life, David said, he said, I became nervous and anxious I became impatient and I began to cut corners and I compromised. And the result in my life of trusting in myself is that there was heartbreak and defeat and instability. And I brought so much pain into my life and to other people's lives. But he says in this Psalm, when I was a God alone person, he says, God alone was my rock, my salvation, my fortress. He was the place of safety. He goes, I felt secure. I trusted God. I would go up against a giant like Goliath and there was no problem. I had no doubts because I knew that God was with me. And in those days, my heart would burst with worship. I would say, the Lord is my shepherd. And so I had everything that I needed. He leaded me. He led me beside still waters. He led me into green pastures and he restored my soul. He guided me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. And even when I went through the most challenging and frightening moments of life, because I wasn't afraid because God was with me. In those days, I was a God alone person and I felt safe and secure. I trusted in God alone. But as he reflects and he says, but over time, he says, even without thinking, I began to trust in things that I could see and I became a God and person. I trusted in God and the size of my army. I trusted in God and the size of the walls of the city that I had built. I trusted in God and my accomplishments, God and my wealth. And as a result, he says, and really he was surprised. He said, it surprises me that this God and approach to life made me insecure and unstable. And when I faced challenges, I faced giants, I was overwhelmed with fear. And I was frightened and I tremble. He says, when I was a God alone person, he says, I would say that God alone is my salvation. My honor comes from him. He delivers and he is my hope. When I lived as a God alone person, I, li I lived to please God alone. I knew that all of my honor came from God. But over time, I became a popular king and I was recognized and there was fame that I had. And the applause of people slowly began to change me. At first, it was something that I enjoyed, but then it was something that I wanted. And finally, the applause of people became something that I needed. And I lost sight of what was most important. And as a God and person, I wanted to please God and I wanted to hear the applause of people. And I got neither. And as a result, 
I was destroyed. And you can hear the pain in his life in Psalm 62. Look at what he says. He says, so many enemies against one man, all of them trying to kill me. To them, I'm just a broken down wall or a tottering fence. They plan to topple me from my high position. They delight in telling lies about me. They praise me to my face, but they curse me in their hearts. Common people, it talks about poor people or worthless. They're just a puff of wind. Powerful people, rich people, uh, they're not what they appear to be. But if you weigh them all on a scale together, they're just like the breath of the air. He says, don't make a living by extortion or put your hope in stealing. If all your wealth increases, don't make it the center of your life. He speaks with conviction at this point in of his life. And he's saying, I've discovered that to live as a God alone person is the only way to live. And then finally, he concludes the psalm this way. He says, one thing God has spoken. Two things I have heard. That you, O God, are strong. And that you, O Lord, are loving. He says, I am going to live as a God alone person and trust that God is strong and God is loving. And you know, when we read this psalm, every one of us could write a psalm, this psalm in our own words because we've all lived this life. All of us have uh, lived in a season of our life where we lived as God alone people. And we would say, God alone, my soul finds rest in God alone, that I trust in him. I trust in him with my future. I trust him with my family, my health, my wealth. I trusted him in every area of my life. I was convinced that he was powerful. I knew that he was loving and I could trust him wherever. And as a result of that, I experienced freedom and peace. There were seasons in my life where I said, God alone is my rock, my fortress. He is a good shepherd that will take care of me and provide for me and love me, and I can trust him even in the most difficult and challenging moments of life. Whatever giants I faced, I would trust in God alone. And that I was so radically secure in his love that I would hold on to his promises in the most difficult moments in life. But all of us could write, just like David did, that second stanza where he says, but you know what, I became a God and person. I began to trust in God and my wealth, trust in God and my resources. I thought that I could love God and love this world, that I would want to serve God and I would want to serve myself and my selfish desires. I would want to please God and I thought I could please others at the same time. And I found out exactly what David did, that a God and lifestyle only leads to pain and sadness and destruction. In 2 Corinthians, it says, so we don't look at the troubles that we can see now. See, that's sight, and it only overwhelms us. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things that we see now will soon be gone. But the things that we cannot see will last forever. And David says in this psalm, there are two things that I know. I know that God is strong and I know that he is loving. And in this moment, this tragic and difficult moment in his life, he takes a hold of these two truths and he has clarity. And you know, one of the things that I think that you could do today, and I did all of this week, is literally write this psalm in our own words. Because I think what made it powerful for David isn't that he just thought this psalm, but he took the time to write it. And in writing it, it developed that conviction in his heart and brought that clarity. And you could write the psalm. All of us could write this song that later today, you could just use Psalm 62 as an outline. The first stanza is that my soul finds rest in God alone. How would you put that in your own words? That God alone is my rock, my refuge, my safe place. That God alone is the one who saves me and delivers me. And when you think about those seasons in your life, you'll remember how trusting him gave you confidence and security that you felt, you felt like you were in the right place because you were trusting in God alone. But in the second stanza, all of us have seasons in our life where we became God and people. We said, I trusted God and my wealth. I trusted God and my business. I thought God and all of these things in life. And as a result, I was insecure and I was anxious and I lived a worried life. But David says, and we can write as a conclusion like David did, but there are two things that I know. 
I know that God is good and I know that God is powerful. He is loving. And these two things, we can have clarity even in the most uncertain times in our life. And then David not only wrote Psalm 62 when he was alone in the desert, but he also wrote Psalm 63. And when he focuses on Psalm 63, he's really focusing on God's love. He says, oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. David realizes when he's in the desert, there is no water that can quench the thirst of his soul. And so he goes on, he says, your unfailing love is better than life. How I praise you. And he says, I will lift up my hands. You satisfy me more than anything else in life. And so he writes this psalm about God's love. When you are filled with fear, the answer in your life needs to be God's love. You need to be reminded about how God loves you. And to, you need to write a psalm like David did about God's love. You know God's love. I mean, all of us, even though we were broken and we rebelled against God, we ran from God. God loved us too much to leave us that way. I mean, we infected our own lives with the disease of sin and it destroyed all of us. It's 100% death. And so God loved us too much and so he showed us, showed up in the person of Jesus Christ and he became like us so he understands what it feels like to be alone, to feel lost, to have unanswered prayers, to feel insecure and weak. And he came to this world and ultimately he knew the only way to rescue us was to take the virus of sin that was killing us and he went to the cross and he died the death that we were already dying to give us the life that we could never have on our own. And so he died destroying the power of sin to give us life and health, to give us love and forgiveness and to give us the power that we need for life. And so we can do what it says in Hebrews. We have this high priest of ours who understands all of our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly into the throne of our gracious God, and there we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. When you are overwhelmed by fear, we need to do what David did. We need to write a psalm to God, our psalm, a psalm about God's love where we write, um, oh God, you are my God. I search for you. I long for you. I need you more than anything else in life. That your unfailing love is what satisfies me. It is the only thing that does. And when we write a psalm, when we take that time like David did to write about God's love or to write about God's goodness and to hold on to his promises, when we hold on to God's promises, when we have an uncertain future, we have faith. When we hold on to God's love, we do not live with fear. We can write these Psalms and experience what David did. And we can, even in moments of uncertainty, have absolute clarity of his love and his strength in our lives. Pray with me. Father, we are so grateful that you are a God that is loving and that you are a God who is powerful. And God, it is true, we are weak and small and we are broken and we have nowhere else to turn. But God, you are loving and you are good. And these truths hold us and sustain us in the most challenging and difficult moments in life. God, would you give us and remind us your love and God, would you fill us with your grace? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. That is so true. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Our God reigns. In a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing, a prayer of benediction over you. But at the end of our services, typically when we gather physically, we always mention or we mention regularly that we have offering boxes on your way out. And we thank those of you who give. And we don't have offering boxes now because we're not gathering physically. So all of our giving has needed to move online. And so if you're a guest with us today, we, we are not asking you to give. But for those of you who Mariners is your church home, on the screen there's going to be text to give options. And I want to invite you to give so that the work of Christ through your church can continue. And for some of you, you've, you have carried our church in the past with your giving, and you are going to be unable to give as freely as you gave in the past because your job has been impacted in recent months and recent weeks. And I want you to know that you should feel no guilt for that at all because the scripture says that our giving should be in proportion to our income. And so if you have less income now, I, I don't want you to feel guilty as you can't give as you've been able to give in the past. But for some of you, uh, your income hasn't been impacted. And I want to encourage you to continue to be generous to your church. And, and there's others of you, you've come into the Mariners family in the last six months or a year, and you haven't yet jumped on the journey of giving. And I want to encourage you to jump on board with giving. There, there's people who've carried Mariner's Church in the past who are in a, in a season where they're going to be unable to give as they've given. And so we need some of you who are new to our church to and are able to give for you to step into this journey and to give generously. And so you'll see the text to give options on the screen. Well, let me pray a prayer of blessing and benediction over you as we leave. Will you extend your hands and I'm going to pray for you. Father, in homes all throughout Orange County and even other places, your children, your sons and daughters have their hands extended to you now. And I pray that this week you will replace in their hearts their worries with your peace, their anxiety with your joy, their fear with your faith that you love them. I pray that you will bless them and keep them I pray that you will meet all of their needs according to your riches and glory. I pray that they will sense your presence in their lives this new week. Cause your face to shine on them, Lord. Keep them, bless them, take care of your children. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.